James with Start Automating, and today we're going to talk through some useful regexes that you don't have to write. Before we get to that, brief introduction. Uh, again, I'm James Brundage with Start Automating. Uh, I've been a PowerShell consultant now for about uh, 11 years and change. Before that, I was on the PowerShell team, and that brings me up to about 15 years scripting with PowerShell. This is a language I love, and I particularly like making useful and interesting tools and toys. Uh, and that has made me learn a number of interesting skills. Uh, one of those skills that I have a kind of love-hate with and I've gotten pretty decent with is regex. And so considering how painful regex is to a lot of people and how useful it can be when used properly, I've gone built a tool to save us all the trouble. What is this tool, you might ask? It is irregular. Regular expressions made strangely simple. Irregular will help you write regex and provides a useful and growing library of built-in regexes. At this point, just over 75, uh, but growing at least a couple a month. Patterns are stored in irregular or any module beneath the regex subfolder. You can have a simple pattern named star.regex.txt, so, you know, digits.regex.txt and that will actually have the contents of the regular expression with a couple of options turned on, ignore case and ignore pattern white space. That last one allows you to comment the regexes, so it's not just that there are 70 regexes that you can already use, but that most of them are commented and can help you understand what they're doing. There are also pattern generators, which are named star.regex.ps1, and these can take parameters. These are incredibly powerful. Uh, and obviously could be built to match anything that you'd like. Now you can use get regex to see what's available so you can kind of explore reg regular this way and kind of see what works for you. You can use use regex to match, split, replace, extract, and any number of other things with any regex pattern or any saved pattern. And write regex will allow you to craft regular expressions uh, in a nice fluent pipeline where you pipe write regex to write regex to write regex. So it's a pretty potent toolkit. Uh, you can use it for a number of things, um, but it really kind of opens up the, the world of regex to you. Regex patterns can all be used with this smart alias to the use regex command. And for example, PowerShell requires. Now, if you're familiar a little bit with regex, this is close to the format of a named capture group. So it all kind of fits. All right, let's take a look at how this all works. So first I'm gonna go ahead and import the module. And then I'm gonna go basically get the module and its files. All right, and we're going to start off pretty simple. We're just going to find all the multi-line comments anywhere in here. Easy. How many of those do I have? Now, what's a multi-line comment? It's one of those generators. This is what it'll, you know, output by default. If I provide it the language of PowerShell, it'll give me a PowerShell multi-line comment. I can also give it, say, a language of PHP or CSHTML. Oh, I guess it's kind of nice to note one of the things that Irregular does it overrides the formatter for uh, regular expressions themselves so that they display with this nice syntax highlighter. Anyway, moving on from multi-line comment to something practical, let's see where I have a requires statement. Okay, only two different places. Uh, suppose I wanted to know where, I could say select input object value. All right, so those are the two places that I have a require statement. Uh, going back to another example here of a generator, I can go ahead and ask for a help field, in this case all examples, and I can extract them. That'll return them back as a property bag. So let's see. Oh, 
Let's go ahead and pipe that to get member to see what it returns back. Let's go ahead and select object expand property content. And there are all my examples. If I don't do this with extract, I get back the matches. I can also look for something like an email address. I don't think I would find one here, but let's just check. Oh, well, that's a little weird, so let's go ahead and see where that email address was used. Oh, it, it, it's it's there in tests. I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, a lot of the regex generators, you can actually kind of provide a little bit of regular expression when you pass it. So if I wanted to find all fields that were an example, synopsis, or description, there you go. Pretty nifty. Uh, getting a lot more crazy. One of the common misconceptions about regular expressions is that you can't balance brackets. Sure you can. Those are all the brackets balanced within a regular in all of its files. At least the PS1s. Those are all the curly braces. few more of those. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and control C of that. And for good measure, here are all the balance parentheses. Now, if you do want to see how the sausage is made, of course, you can go ahead and echo a given expression. And again, most of them are commented, which makes it a little bit easier to understand what's going on. Getting much more fancy here for a second. Let me move to the uh, repository itself. Where I actually have some git logs. And I'm going to go ahead and get my git logs and actually pull them out as structured data. So there's all my git log messages. If I wanted to extract this out, I can pull out stuff like the commit hash, git user email, and commit date. And basically I can use get member with extract to explore what captures are available to me. So I can look at the user email, user name, commit message if I wanted to. Let's go ahead and So there we are. Again, really powerful stuff. Uh, just to get a little bit more crazy though, one of my favorite new tricks is uh, using some HTML link data. This is uh, yet another one of the in bo the box expressions you can use. Uh, I'm going to go and extract the data found in this IMDB page for a second. And it's going to come back with a JSON content match. And let's run the whole thing. Convert it back from JSON. Uh, and let's see how long the movie is. Let's see description of the movie. And uh, just for good measure, the name of the movie. It's Reg Exception. So, yeah, that's a regular. It's a fun, cool, you know, regex module that has a lot of fun toys in it, and um, new toys are being added all the time. In fact, on that note, if you have any questions, if you need some regex help, feel free to reach out. I kind of like an interesting challenge at this point because I'm a little broken. Uh, go ahead and at me at Twitter uh, if you'd like. I'm sometimes on there at James Brew. You can reach out on the PowerShell Discord at Start Automating. Uh, the project for regular is on GitHub. It's Start Automating slash Irregular. You can also get it from the gallery. And you can also reach out the very old school way with email james.brundage at start automating.com. So that's a regular for you. Hope this helps. Thanks.
Greetings all, and welcome to this session on the PowerShell Secrets Management Vault with the LastPass extension. My name is Mike Nelson, and feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at MikeNelsonIO, or check out my GitHub. So for this session, we are going to be talking about the uh, PowerShell Secret Store module along with the PowerShell Secret Management module. Now, firstly, talking about the Secret Management module, if you're not aware of what that is or you haven't worked with it, um, it has just been released GA. And you, all it is is pretty much just a, a module that allows you to uh, do gets and sets of secret information. That's, that's it in a nutshell, okay? Um, and it does have gets and sets against uh, what they call vaults. And those vaults can be either a store which is what Microsoft has created called the uh, secret store, which I mentioned, um, or it can be against a third party vault, which is like a Azure key vault or a LastPass or a HashiCorp vault or a KeyPass, things like that. So it really is uh, multifunctional in terms of it can work with multiple vaults at one time. Now, you can work with a vault directly, right? You can load a module um, and work with like LastPass or KeyPass um, through PowerShell and work with it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. With the secret management module, it allows you to work with multiple vaults at one time. And those could be, the, like I said, the third-party vaults or in the secret store because the secret store is a registry of vaults. So you can create multiple vaults, all right? stored locally, okay, on file, on your local machine, uh, inside of the store, all right? And that works, again, uh, cross-platform on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And it has a bunch of parameters that go along with it, uh, but it's really simple to use. So if you're not familiar with it, I, I highly recommend you check it out. And we're just going to do a brief demo here. Um, and that demo is going to be, first, a little bit of the secret management portion of it. Then we're going to go to LastPass and configure that. And then I'm actually going to demo connecting to a uh, web interface of a storage array, um, which requires a uh, secure string on the password side and a user ID, which we'll pull from our LastPass vault. Very simple demonstration just to show you how you can interact with that vault. But first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the extension itself. Tyler Leonard works for Microsoft. He created this as a hackathon project. Um, it is not maintained, so it does not have all the implementation uh, that you can get off the LastPass API. Um, it still needs work. Looking for you know contributors to continue this work, um, or else he's hoping that LastPass takes it over, which is highly doubtful um, given the state of who owns them now. Um, he does use the LastPass CLI. The LastPass CLI um, was, is a Linux package that interacts directly with LastPass. It talks uh, to the API directly. Um, the key point here is it's a Linux package. So when Tyler did this, he did it as a hackathon project uh, using PowerShell on Linux, PowerShell 7, and then also this LastPass CLI. What he did also was he uh, improved it a bit by creating a switch, a WSL switch that you can use. So you can use a WSL. You can run it on Windows as kind of like a, a wrapper to the commands that get passed on through the WSL to LPAS, which is running on Linux, which I'm going to show you today. Now, you could use modules, like I said. Go ahead and search GitHub uh, for various modules that are out there, or the PS galleries. Um, though, again, one-to-one -one relationship where the secret management is a one-to-many type of relationship. So as you can see here, I have a terminal window. This terminal window has Ubuntu 18.04 and also has a PowerShell 7 admin session. Inside of Ubuntu, you can see I've created uh, uh, the LPAS. I've installed it with the dependencies. Very simple to do. Um, just follow the instructions uh, for whatever flavor of Linux you want to use. Now, you could interact directly from here with LastPass if you wanted to. Otherwise, you know, go ahead and use uh, PowerShell on the Windows side. Here I have a PowerShell 7.1.3 session. You can see I've imported the modules uh, to be used. The secret management is the, again, the gets and sets against the vaults. Uh, the secret store is the local file uh, store that can contain multiple vaults in it. And this is a Microsoft thing. And then you also have uh, the secret management LastPass extension, which is required to interact with LastPass. So what we're going to do here is we're just really going to quickly go over the secret store configuration because this is kind of key to any vault that you work with, not just LastPass, but any vault. Um, we're going to get the uh, secret store configuration. It's set right now for, you know, the defaults of authentication, none, password timeout, no password timeout, interaction, none, which means that it will not interaction interact for a prompt uh, of the password. It will just give you an error. You have to pass it as a, as a secure string on the command line. So we're going to reset this real quick um, to the defaults, and it's really easy to do uh, just by doing a set secret store configuration uh, as default. And it'll go back to what it was. It wants a password. I'll put in the password here. So now if I do a get secret store configuration, it's going to want the password, which is good. And it's going to tell me it, it set everything to fault. Watch out for that password timeout. 15 minutes might not be long enough for some of your automation, so you might want to increase that. Now, again, this is a secret store. This isn't the last pass of all. This is a secret store that Microsoft um, has offered up as, you know, the, the uh, bearer of multiple vaults on your local machine, if you care to use that. So if I do a get secret, secret info right now, 
Um, it's going to tell me there are no vaults registered. So I'm going to quickly register a vault here inside of the secret store. And when I register the vault, notice the module name is using the secret store, not the LastPass extension. Once I do that, and then I go and get a secret info again, it'll say, oh, no more error because you do have a vault registered, uh, but there are no secrets in it. And just to prove that I have the vault registered, I'll do a get secret vault. There it is right there, test vault 01. So I'm going to set a secret right now inside of that vault. And uh, you can see it's just a plain text secret called secrets. And then what I'm going to do is I'm also going to put in a secure string. And that's going to be generated by the get credential. And the get credential, I'm just going to use user and user. It is now put that in that variable. And I am going to put it in the secret vault. Now, when I go out and take a look at that uh, secret info that's in that vault, it should tell me, hey, yeah, you added a string, uh, demo one, and you added a secure string PS credential of demo secure two. Now we're going to move on to LastPass. Now, again, you have to register the LastPass vault, right? So you're registering a secret vault with the secret management module, and you're using the module name of secretmanagement.lastpass. You can give it any name or any, any name you want. So I've registered that vault now. Now, to make sure that you have that vault available, you're going to put in get secret vault. Now you can see you have your chest vault 01, which we created before, and now we have a LastPass vault. Now that we've done that, we need to move on to actually configuring the LastPass module. That is another register, but it's a register LastPass vault. We give it a name and then notice the WSL switch. That is going to tell it to interact with the default WSL instance. And the path for the LPAS command line is slash user slash bin slash LPAS. Once that is in there, okay, now we can connect directly to the vault. And I'm going to show you that I did create a vault here uh, with a demo user. It's live. It's real. Um, it is the free version. Okay. So it is the, the 20 day trial of premium, all that kind of fun stuff. But um, what I've noticed with the free version is it takes longer to update than the premium version. So one thing to remember, if you are using the free version and you're doing this in a scripted fashion, you need to be careful about when this actually gets updated. You may have to put a delay in there in order to, to utilize this on the cloud aspect. It's local cache is good, right? But if you need to reference the cloud um, uh, repository that LastPass has, that might not be updated right away. If you're using the premium version, I've, I've seen that take just seconds. Um, where this one, you actually might have to log back out and log back in again to see it actually change. All right, so from here, I'm going to actually connect to the LastPass vault that I have that I just showed you. I'm using the vault name, uh, my username. I'm doing a trust, which is the multi-factor authentication. So it's not going to prompt me uh, for that multi-factor. And I want to stay connected, right? So I'm going to go ahead and, and say yes here. And it should come back and tell me, okay, here, I want to know what your master password is for that vault. And then I should get a connect message. There we are. Success. Logged in. Good. Now I'm real quickly going to add a secret. And this secret um, is just like an RDP connection that uses, you know, a, a plain text password. Um, notice the last command there, sync last pass vault. What that's trying to do is that's syncing the local cache with what's in the cloud. Now, if I go back to uh, my web interface and I do a refresh, like I said, I'm on the free version. It doesn't show, right? But if I log out and then I log back in, there, it shows up. So it's really kind of weird. I mean, I don't have to do that with the premium version, but I have to do that with the, with the free version. So uh, here we go. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm actually going to go through and do a scenario where I'm going to connect to a uh, the storage array uh, web interface. So I'm going to import the module for my pure storage array, which uh, I just import that PowerShell SDK. And I'm going to go right through these commands here. As you can see here, what I'm doing is I'm actually stepping through this we go down to the secure password, pure user. Uh, the secure secret is being put in a secure string. It's setting the secret, calling it with the variable name of secret, uh, syncing the vault. It's taking a variable. It's getting the secret info from the from the vault. It's telling you what the secret info dot name is, which is pure. This is the ID that comes across. Kind of kind of weird, but you just need to know that 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 name. And then secret info dot type is going to tell you that it's a PS credential or a secure string. And then we're setting a variable to get the secret again. Okay, and we're getting the secret dot username and the secret dot password. We're converting it from a secure string as plain text, and it tells you that it is pure user. So all I need to do now is I just need to connect to the array using those variables. Now, if you think about this from a scripting aspect, um, you know, that it's pretty easy. So I'm just connecting right now. Boom. It pulled that information. Now, if I were to script all this inside of a function, inside of a, uh, a automation uh, scenario, um, it would be simple, easy. I wouldn't even have to really interact with it at all, and I'd be able to hit multiple vaults at once. That's it for the demo. I'd really like to thank you uh, for stopping by and watching this lightning round. And if you need to reach me again, Mike Nelson IO on Twitter or stop by my GitHub at Mike Nelson IO. Thanks.
Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jatin Purohit. I am Senior Technical Marketing Manager at VMware and in this session I will demonstrate how to leverage PowerShell DSC to build and configure the vSphere environment. The PowerShell DSC is a management framework built into PowerShell which provides the infrastructure as a code approach to build and configure the IT infrastructure. The whole idea behind PowerShell DSC is to have a configuration document written in a declarative code style and apply the configuration document on the target endpoint, ensuring that the target endpoint receives the configuration and ensures that it complies with the desired state configurations. The vSphere DSC module provides the PowerShell DSC resources for vSphere. The module currently has 70 plus resources to configure different configuration aspects within vCenter and ESXi host. The vSphere DSC module can be implemented in two ways. The first one is Microsoft PS Desired State module and the second one is with VMware provided PS Desired State configuration module. If we go with the approach one, then Microsoft provided PS Desired State configuration module requires a local configuration manager to receive and execute the configuration on the target endpoint. In case of vSphere, we have two important endpoints. The first one is the vCenter server and the second one is the ESXi host. Both vCenter server and ESXi host doesn't have PowerShell running on it. So that means that we don't really have a local configuration manager running inside the vCenter server and ESXi host. In order to execute the vSphere DSC resources on vSphere environment, what we need to do is we need to set up a proxy LCM server. And this proxy LCM server is basically a Windows server which will receive the DSC configuration on behalf of vSphere endpoints such as vCenter and ESXi host and creates a VI session to ensure that the vSphere environment is configured as per the desired state. The Microsoft provided PS desired state configuration module compiles the configuration in a MOF file and execute this particular MOF file with the help of local configuration manager. This particular approach clearly creates some operational overhead for us in order to execute the DSC resources on vSphere. The second method, which is VMware provided PS desired state configuration module, uses something called invoke DSC resource cmdelet. The invoke DSC resource cmdelet currently is an experimental feature which allows you to execute the DSC resources without requiring to have PowerShell LCM engine. This means that now you can directly apply the DSC configuration on, onto the vSphere environment without involving the local configuration manager. In this particular demonstration, I will be using the VMware.ps desired state configuration module and as a part of the configuration, we will be configuring the different configuration aspect within the vCenter and the ESXi host. As a part of the vCenter server configuration, we will be creating a vSphere cluster. We will be creating a DV switch. Once the vCenter server configurations are done, we will be moving all the ESXi host to the newly built cluster. We will be ensuring that the ESXi host networking with respect to standard switch and distributed switch is taken care. And at last, we will be configuring the two NFS data store, the HPT DS01 and HPT DS02. Let me go into the lab environment and uh, you can see that on the vCenter server, we don't have any vSphere cluster. Uh, similarly, uh, we don't have the distributed switch and DV port group over here. And if I can show you the ESXi host configuration, then you can see that the host network configuration are not correct. We want to have VMNIC0 and VMNIC1 to the vSwitch0. And similarly, 2 and 3 to the distributed switch. If we check the data store, then we don't have the HPT DS01 and HPT DS02 uh, mounted on the respective ESXi host. Let me quickly show you the configuration document. The configuration document is written in a .ps1 file. Uh, if you see that it's a declarative code style where we are specifying uh, we want to create an HA cluster, we want to create a DRS cluster. These are the properties of the DRS cluster. Uh, then we want to create a VD switch and ensuring that the VD switch version is 6.6.0. .6 uh, in the similar fashion, we want to create a V2 port group on the same DV switch. Once the vCenter server configurations are done, we want to move all the ESXi host to the newly built uh, vSphere cluster, which is DSC demo. And then we want to ensure that the vSwitch 0 has two NIC card, VMNIC 0 and VMNIC 1. Similarly, VMNIC 2 and 3 has to be part of the HPT DS02. Um, 
we want to also create or mount the HPT DS01 and HPT DS02 NFS data store on the respective ESXi host and at last we will be configuring the network core term and uh, all of these ESXi host configuration we will be repeating on each and every ESXi host. So now let's uh, execute new VMware DSC configuration uh, provide the configuration to the path parameter so in this case the configuration document is dsc node.ps1 and assign this uh, this cmd led to a config variable and then pass that config variable to uh, start vmw dsc configuration so instead of passing a mop file uh, in case of powershell lcm engine in this case we are just passing a powershell object which is a basically a powershell variable uh, containing the configuration document so now you can see that uh, the start VMW DSC configuration has uh, executed. Now it is working on uh, HPT ESXi01 and uh, at, at present it is doing the network core dump configurations. And if we can quickly see the uh, vSphere UI, we can see that the cluster has been created. You can see the DSC demo cluster. Uh, you can see that the two data store DS01 and DS02 are created. Uh, in the similar fashion we have the distributed switch and uh, we will be repeating the same configuration for each and every ESXi host. So now it is working on HPT ESXi02. Executing now on HPT ESXi03. And now it is executing on the last ESXi host and the execution is completed now and uh, if we can quickly test the dsc configuration using test vmw dsc configuration and use the detail switch we can see that the uh, configurations are compliant the vsphere environment is compliant and it will show you that it is in desired state right so you can see in desired state is set as true now what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna delete a couple of settings so first i will turn off the vsphere ha and uh, after that i will turn off uh, or I will delete the uh, DB port group which is DB management. So now if we execute the test VMW DSC configuration you will see that um, the overall compliance will be returned as false and it will also show you what are the resources uh, which are not in desired state. So uh, the detail switch is an optional parameter. Um, yeah as, as you can see over here the VD port group and uh, HA cluster resource are uh, not in desired state. So if you use the detail switch, you can get uh, this level of detail uh, through test VMW DSC configuration. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, thank you for joining this session. And for more information, you can visit the GitHub Wiki page. The project is open source. You can also contribute the project. Uh, you can also join uh, VMware code on Slack and uh, add the vSphere DSC channel, which is PowerCLI DSC Contrib and be part of the vSphere DSC conversations. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter uh, at the rate PowerCLI is, is our Twitter page and all the things related to PowerCLI uh, you can visit the developer.vmware.com slash PowerCLI. Thank you. Hey, what's up? My name is Chrissy and today I'm going to talk about Tin Tools, which is a PowerShell module that I created to enhance a customer's manual business process. I wanted to do this lightning talk because I want more people to know about Tin Tools. I don't really talk about it that much, but also I thought that it would be cool to highlight how PowerShell can help make tedious things and business processes a lot of fun. So using my PowerShell skills and diversified background, I recently switched from being a longtime DBA to being a security engineer, and I'm currently charged with performing security scans and vulnerability analysis using Tenable.sc and Nessus. I'm expected to scan numerous offline networks, which can really introduce some challenges. And upon starting, I immediately encountered four problems. And the first was disorganized and non-standardized scan processes. So scanners had varied usernames, asset lists, organization format names, and all of these parts of Tenable.sc and Nessus it they couldn't be predicted. So I, as the analyst, had to re-familiarize myself from environment to environment. 
And for any analyst who didn't have previous experience but was still expected to set up scanners, the process of deploying Tenable.sc was error prone and time consuming. In addition, the monthly and quarterly plugin updates were totally tedious and super boring. And finally, the local documentation was anemic. So we had a lot of awesome best practices like organization-wide documentation, but the specifics of our local implementations could really be beefed up. So the first thing that I wanted to do with PowerShell was standardize the process. And the ultimate goal was to create established and time-tested processes. So I read the best practices and then implemented those within the code. And with automated deployments, deployments went from taking a couple hours to just a couple minutes. And being able to deliver these systems faster even eased disaster recovery because I could literally blow away an entire entire VM and just restore it in a matter of minutes using this process. Now with automated updates, admins no longer needed to manually update or re-troubleshoot issues because any of the problems that I ran into, I built the solution right into the code and ultimately into the process. So deployment configs, what's really awesome about that is that it could be kept in source control, which leads to greater accountability and understanding of point in time decisions because the commit holds all of the documentation if you're doing good commits. So now I'm going to move on to the demo. First, I'll give you a quick, a really quick overview of Tenable.sc and highlight some of the issues that can be problematic. Then I'll show you the code and configs that are used to perform deployments. And finally, we'll take a look at some of the documentation, the repo, and a pre-recorded deployment video. All right, so now we're gonna take a very quick tour of Tenable.sc and I'll highlight some of these problems that I was able to, um, to automate. So the first thing is that there's a lot to do, right? The, already we have this overwhelming screen and this is just for the administrator. It's not even for the other account, which is more of a godlike account called the security manager. But when you're working with the admin user, you know, but you also have to make sure that your IP ranges are there. And one of the first things that I really messed up was that I didn't have overlapping IP ranges whenever I was going through the rest of the process so my scans wouldn't start and it was very confusing. It's just a lot to remember. Like it is just an overwhelming process. Also, you have to have your credentials. And each of these times that you're adding it, you're going and you're like, add credentials, select the type. And there's just a lot of clicking, a lot of clicking. But whenever I see a lot of clicking, I also see a lot of potential for automation, which is what I delivered in 10 tools. So let's go ahead and jump into VS Code and see first the goal of what it was that I wanted to address with 10 tools, and then we'll watch that video of the deployment. All right, so here was the ultimate goal, right? I wanted to take a JSON file and just pipe that to a PowerShell command, and this does all of the work. Let's go ahead and take a look at the JSON file. What I really like about it is that it's human readable, it's easy to modify, and you can just copy and paste this into a repository, change it as you wish, and then save that to source control. So for here, we have the computer name. For me, it's Security Center. If you've named it SC in your environment, you can change it that way. For the administrator credential, this is plain text. So it'll pop up and it'll say, admin, please enter in your password. But this could actually be used from with a secret store, which is really cool. And you go through and you might be thinking like, hey, Chrissy, these, these, these variable names, how am I going to pass that to a PowerShell command? And you can go ahead and take a look at the source code, 10 tools, T-E-N-T-O-O-L-S, is on GitHub. Um, and you can look at start, T, and deploy. But the answer is essentially value from pipeline by property name. It'll take that and then use it across your script. And I do want to highlight real quick, if you have the chance, anytime that you're making a PowerShell module, if you can 
implement this low-hanging security fruit, do try your best. I do. Um, in this case, I made it really easy to replace all of the certificates. So when you go here, uh, this connection is secure. And that's a lot better than telling somebody, hey, can you just click through? Uh, <laughs> can you just, as a security analyst, can you just accept that security warning? So I really like this and I, I accomplished it with PowerShell. So this is what our deployment looks like. And let's go ahead and take a look at a, uh, a video that shows the actual deployment. So here's that admin that I was talking about. You enter in your password or again, could be used with a security vault and you go through, you paste it in. Here's the security manager password. Here's where we're creating our credentials. So the Windows scanner account, the Linux scanner account, the SQL server scanner account. And then from here, what I really love is that you just sit back, you just sit back. You implement these progress bars because people love progress bars. Your fellow developer loves your progress bars. Auditors love it. Your manager loves it. And it gives people a good sense of where they're at in the process. Uh, so the process of deployment used to take two and a half hours. Now it's about two and a half minutes. This is the output. Super exciting. Now there's a fully stocked tenable.sc machine that is ready for deployment. Let's go ahead and take a look at the repository. Again, this is all open source. You can contribute to it. I would totally love that. You can use it. It's out in the PowerShell gallery. And I did want to highlight. So here I have documentation for the person that's going to perform the installs, give usage scenarios, talk about support. But then I also created a wiki for managers so that they know where 10 tools belongs within their organization. So it talks about the purpose and the roles, and you can even copy and paste this simplified deployment. And finally, I am doing a session on GitHub Actions. I just want to show you this because it's so, so cool. What I love about it is that I am able to test all of my PowerShell commands with each and every commit to my GitHub repo. So I was able to create, and this blew my mind, I was able to create a container with the Nessus web server in it. And I made that private. I saved that to the GitHub container repository. I set my workflow to download the image, to start up the container, to actually write the license that I got from Nessus, um, from secrets to disk so I can relicense it each time. I have it write my certificate authority and trust it so that I have security from top to bottom. I also wrote a GitHub action for us PowerShell users, instead of going out to the gallery over and over and over again to download uh, required modules, I did set up a, a PowerShell module cacher. And after I initialize the Nessus server with the admin user and license each and every time, just to make sure that process works, I also run, let's see, 24 pester tests. So each and every time, if I get that green check mark, then I know that my module hasn't been negatively impacted in its functionality with each of my commits. So thank you so much for joining me today. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me on the PowerShell Discord. I'm at CL and I'm also on Twitter at twitter.com slash CL. Welcome, I'm James O'Neill. I'd like to show you this module I've just published to the PowerShell gallery that goes by the name of Microsoft Graph++. Uh, Graph++ is built on a module that uh, comes out of a team within Microsoft. Um, and if you look at the GitHub repo for the module, you can see there were a number of faults that I found with that module and I've decided to try and add some things to uh, what it does to make it a bit more PowerShelly. Now there's an awful lot of stuff included in Microsoft Graph. Uh, this diagram actually is, is included in with the module and you get some idea how many different pieces there are to talk to and how many different commands we've got. Obviously I'm not going to show you all those commands in a session of this length. Just having a, a little pop at, uh, at the other module. I've got a session open to another machine here and I'm just going to load the um, 
the, the other graph module, which is quite big and extensive, and it, it takes a little while to load. So while that's loading, I'm just going to come over here. I've pre-cached some credentials for something I'm going to do later on, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to import uh, graph plus plus, and it uses whatever parts of the SDK modules it can find. So you can see there, it's actually said, I couldn't find all the bits that I wanted, but if it just can see the, the necessary DLLs without the whole module, uh, it will enable the functionality for those. So if I reload uh, Graph++ and specify force to make sure it does that, this time it says I'm ready for a connection and uh, the, um, there's no message about skipping anything. So I'm going to uh, just do a connection. It's logged me in with cache credentials and I can start working directly with the REST API. So I can do something like uh, invoke graph request. The MG prefix is because the command came from the, uh, the SDK module and I can give it a very simple um, REST API um, URI. So that one has said go to version one and find out about the current user. You can see the full thing there, and this has come back as uh, as a hash table showing me what the uh, what the fields and their values were. Um, I can start working a bit more the way I'd expect and uh, ask it for, for example, my graph domains. So this will show me what's my default domain and what other domains do I have. Now, while that's been happening, you just see there the other one's loaded. So that, that's how far I've got while the other one was loading. And I can now say I want to create a new user, so we don't need this one anymore. So we'll close that and maximize this one. So what I'm going to do is just create a new graph user. And uh, this one we'll call, uh, let's create a new user and we'll call her Carol and we better give her a last name. So we'll make that singer. And because we know the default domain, we can actually use some rules that say, well, I probably use first space last for display name and first dot last for a user principal name. And I know the default domain and I can make up a password. So I like to use sort of random dates as passwords because they fit into the, the normal password rules. I don't necessarily want my users to look like that. So I might do another user and I might say I've got a, uh, a rule for male nicknames. The nickname rule is just use the given name. And this user I'm going to call Doug. And we better give Doug a surname. So Doug's surname will have that. And I can go a bit further so I can say I want Doug to have a manager. And you'll see here that tab expansion expands the manager because that's kind of how I expect things to work. And I want him to belong to some groups. So again, I can just tab complete my groups. And I even want to give him a license. So I'll give him a license. And again, we get tab completion there. So there we go. Nice and easy way of creating a group, uh, creating a user. Now, doing all these demos, I do find that um, I keep going and deleting users that I want back. So I've got a user from a previous session, but Unfortunately, they, they've been deleted, but I can use the Active Directory Recycle Bin to go and find that user. And if I pipe that into Restore, I can get them back. So you can see I'm already starting to do the things you'd expect to work with with um, uh, Pipe. And if I uh, go and look for the user who I used as a manager, you can see, well, he's called Jacob Marley. If you if you know your uh, your Christmas Carol from Dickens, you know it starts with uh, Marley was dead to begin with. So um, we probably better transfer his direct reports. So I can actually go and have a look at uh, Jacob, and I can go and see who his direct reports are. So you can see I've got that new user and a, a previous user that I had, and I can just say, and I want to send those to set graph user and give them a new manager. I'm going to make me the manager. Well, I say me, I've actually been logged in as a different user up to this point. 
So what I want to do is just switch users. And this is where that credential I had at the beginning comes in. So I'm going to do disconnect graph, which obviously logs me out. And if I just do connect graph again without specifying a credential, it wants to take me to the interactive login. And I don't always want an interactive login. And sometimes it's also useful to be able to do a um, an additional login as a, as a temporary thing. So what I can do is I can say connect graph. But use that credential that I preloaded. So now I've changed users and because I keep having to check who it is, I've made a little graph. Who am I alias for one of the commands? So you can see here. Um, the tenant and who I am and what scopes I've got access to. So one of the things that actually we need to set up before we, we before we begin is getting the tenant ID right and the scopes right. And there's a settings file that controls all that. So now if I do get graph user, it'll assume me if I don't specify a user. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say get graph user. I can abbreviate direct reports and I'm just going to store the result in a, in a variable called users. So you can see I restored Robin. I had Bob originally. I've got Doug, so I've got my um, three users and they're now all in a variable called users. And. We extend the uh, user object here, so we have a property set called organization, so I can change the view that I get of of the users to um, uh, sh show different information about the, the users there. What I want to do with these users is actually put them into a team. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want to create a new graph group. And I can say I want it to be a security group. I can make it assignable to a role. This one I want to, to set up as a team. Members are going to be those users. The name of the group is going to be authors. I think we'll have that because we haven't used that one before and we'll give it a description. Uh, so that's my uh, new group there. And I'm going to use that same trick with output variable because I want to uh, to keep the uh, the team for future use in more than one place. So I'm just going to store that in output variable. And if you keep your eye just to the left there, you can see the authors group magically appeared in teams. If I do get graph team with that new team, I can find information about the team. And one of the things I can find out about them is their OneDrive. So again, I'm going to use OV to save that to a variable and I'm just going to make that my default home drive. And if I actually look at team drive, you can see there it is, but because it's my um, default drive, if I do something like get graph drive and say, show me the special folders, so I'll have a look at documents. Well, documents exists, but there's nothing in it, but I can then say, uh, show me the root of there, and you can see I've got a folder for the general tab, and I've got a folder for my special folder for documents. So we can start taking advantage of this um, because we've got Excel support. It'd be rather nice if we used Excel support so we can create an Excel workbook. And there's a cheat here because you can't really create an Excel workbook. But what I can do is just copy up a blank workbook. So that's all this is doing. And if I start hitting tab here, it will tab its way through my different folders and what I can do is say I want to create in documents. I want to create users.xlsx and you can see it formats that rather like it, it, a, a normal local file. And now I can do something like get graph user list. I can format it uh, just using those organizational parameters, but I can actually do export graph worksheet. Uh, send it to sheet one and I need to give it a path. So again, I can bring in my friend tab completion there. So this time if I do documents and a slash and a tab, it will tab complete that and I even say, well, show it to me afterwards. 
So we just do an export. And there's the users in my organization. So those sorts of things, being able to work with files is one thing. Um, we saw some stuff in Teams. So if I just move Teams over a little way, here's the, the general group. I can say, again, because I've um, set teams and set that team to be the to be the default i can say i'm going to create a, a message in one of those in a channel there so it knows the available channels what i'd like to do now is to is to add a a message to the to that uh, channel in teams so what i can do to make that easier is i can say set graph default team and i can make authors my default team. And now when I go new graph channel message and go tab, it should figure out what available channels I've got. So I'm going to just say here, please keep specific stuff to their own channels. If I just move that a fraction, you can see that's just appeared there in Teams. I was hoping it would appear behind the tiled window. But I can also say, well, I'd like, like to have another channel please. So we'll do new graph channel. And I'll give it a default name. And you can see that appears in Teams just in the background there. And now if I go to new graph channel message, it actually knows what it's got to tab complete. So lots and lots of things that I can do there. So we can carry on adding channels. We can because this is a team we can add to its calendar. We can add tabs. Um, we can even work with OneNote. So one of the things that I that uh, we don't have time to, to dive into here is actually outputting stuff to OneNote. What I what I will do for for those who are interested, if you go and have a look at the uh, repository on GitHub, you'll find links there to other content that shows some of the um, demos that I've recorded for other pieces of functionality. So if you're more interested in uh, in OneNote or you're more interested in Outlook or you're interested in the planner, you can pick those up from there. But thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of these sessions. Thank you very much for tuning into the Lightning Demos. Myself and Phil Bossman worked with the presenters from proposal to final product, and we know that they all were very excited to be a part of this. I want to thank each and every one of them for putting together high quality content for the rest of the attendees. I also want to thank the DevOps Collective for allowing Phil and I to play a part in making this summit as great as it always is. I hope you take your newfound knowledge from these videos and put it to good use. Have a great rest of the summit.